Good morning, everybody, and welcome to today's webinar. At Crystal, we like to bring you topical, educational, and engaging content, and today is no exception. This is the latest in our master's series, and today we'll be talking to some true bridging masters. Joining me today are three true examples of this, and I'm delighted to welcome Gareth Lewis, Commercial Director of MT Finance, Nick Jones, Sales Director from West One Loans, and Simon Ward, Specialist Finance Accounts Manager from One Savings Bank. Good morning, gentlemen. Good morning. Good morning. Thank you for joining me today. So this webinar aims to help you as brokers make the most of the opportunities in the bridging finance market, while also ultimately looking to help you write more specialist business for your clients. So during the course of the next hour, we'll be looking at numerous areas of the market, including the post-pandemic marketplace, impacts and other external market forces, along with a look ahead into the future as well. So let's jump straight in. So Gareth, starting with you then, um, just how busy do you think the market is at the moment and what kind of deals are you completing? Uh, look, I think it's been a very positive start to the year. I think um, 
you know, it's always good when you see uh, a start of the year come in a positive way uh, where people are looking around at the marketplace and seeing that um, there is some good uh, consumer confidence. And I think that's what helps a market um, push forward, because ultimately you, you look for a client to have an opportunity to look at transactions, look at uh, property prices, what they're looking to try and achieve for that year. They take stock at, uh, over the Christmas period, as it were, and then they start to um, put things in play. I think what we had was um, quite a nice uh, start where people were actually starting to feel more and more com comfortable and confident as we were coming out of the, the pandemic, as it were. Um, there was sentiment around the easing of lockdowns and, and obviously the easing of COVID restrictions, which again gives you that uh, nice um, puff up chest moment. So, yeah, it's been a very, very good start to the year, I would suggest for most people, um, especially in the sort of forward forecasting side of things. Excellent. And what kind of deals are you seeing completing at the minute? Literally a bit of everything. Um, I think what you've got, to, I think over the pandemic, and I know we're touching on this uh, a bit later, but over the pandemic, what you saw was maybe a little bit of uncertainty around um, buy to let investor and their involvement within the transactional flow that was going on. I think there was a hesitance, um, you know, they were hamstrung by regulation around um, what they could do. Um, within the realms of, of their own um, portfolios. I think there was a notion of understanding where the value was going to truly come out in terms of property. So we've seen a big buoyant rise in, in people trying to get back into that space and stimulate that. I think the regulated arena has, has continued to go from strength to strength. I think um, some of the things we're seeing on that side of things are sort of heavier refurb deals on the regulated space. So, you know, that continued add value, so add square footage to property. Um, that we saw through the, uh, the the beginning of the pandemic when everybody wanted a, an extra bedroom or a, a working office or, or whatever it may be. Um, so, yeah, I think it's been a good spread of, of business mix in, in all honesty. Excellent. Thank you. Uh, Nick? Yeah, certainly echo a lot what, uh, what Gareth just said. It's certainly been a, a busy start to the year. Uh, and even over the last sort of 12 months, uh, I think bridging has certainly come into its own as, as more customers and brokers and lenders look at alternative finance to uh, such as bridging finance to fund property projects and uh, mainstream lenders continue to focus on the, the, the prime vanilla applications. This has led to a, another start, uh, a strong start. You know, looking at the growth over the last sort of 12 months, uh, approximately 12% in the short-term market, taking the market to around about seven, seven and a half, seven point seven billion pounds worth of lending. Um, and as we look further over the next sort of three to four years, this trend is set to continue uh, with a further 50% growth around about 13 billion as well. So that the market is is certainly in uh, in buoyant mood. Um, at West One, we're seeing types of applications, a lot of purchases at the moment, uh, both residential and commercial as well, as people uh, are looking to sort of maximize revenues on the types of portfolios they've got as well. We're seeing quite a demand for sort of land purchases as well, um, you know, for property gains on uh, on uh, planning consent, uh, either to hold it for the increase in value or to then look to development finance and obviously to sort of build those out as well. So I think the the, 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 the market is in buoyant mood. Uh, there's certainly a lot more lenders than there have been. There's been certainly over the last 18 months, two years, there's certainly been uh, pressures uh, downwards on, on price and cost as well. So as it becomes more uh, affordable or certainly more of an alternative option to, uh, to previous, I think that the, the market's set to grow and set to continue, but there are some challenges on the way. Thank you. We'll come on to some of those in a second. Um, <laughs> And Simon, how about from your side? Yeah, uh, firstly, I think I'd like to, 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 to thank you for the invite today. It's always a privilege to come on and participate in these events, try and add a bit of value, insight, guidance on, on what we do on a day-to-day -day basis. Secondly, a warm welcome to everybody who's attended the event today. Um, what a panel, eh? Uh, Honoured to be asked to put on this panel with Gareth and Nick, who are true bridging superstars, bridging masters, as we call them, and industry heavyweights. But hopefully between us, we will we'll today add the value, the insight and the guidance that, that, that I've just talked about on a personal level. My phone is always busy with bridging inquiries along with the other things that, 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 that I do on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, 
have actually got much busier in recent weeks. We've opened out and the precise brand opened over out to uh, the, the sort of heavy refurb in the regulated space, which has been see, received really well. And you'll notice also that Interbay have come back to the market in bridging in the non-regulated space. And that is your standard light, light and heavy refurb, as well as, as some development exit, uh, exit offerings, which we have on there as well. A lot of brokers in, in, in my, my particular area actually reported a slower start in January, not as many inquiries, but then things took off. And I can only echo echo what the two gents have said before me in that it, 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 is, a, it is a buoyant market. It is something that we're, we, we are predicting a very, very busy summer ahead and even going into the winter. And there's lots of opportunities out there for, for, for brokers and, and customers alike. Um, Again, echoing what the guys have said, we're seeing really varied sort of inquiries coming in and stuff that we're, we're, we're writing and doing, whether that's a regulated chain break scenario where sales fell through, whether it's somebody looking to finish a self-build because building costs and material costs have increased so much that their original budget has maybe evaporated, you know, a light refurbishment doing like homes under the hammer refurb special or whether that's a, a heavy reverb refurb like a barn conversion or something like that we're helping lots of brokers and, and their clients fund some really exciting projects as i know my two colleagues who sit in sitting on the panel with me are as well and you guys at crystal um send me lots of lots of stuff which is in in lots of different categories excellent thank you gents that sets the scene nicely um, at the bottom of your screen, um, for all the, the attendees, there's a Q&A button. So please use that if you've got any questions that come up, whether it's a, a case scenario that you'd like us to take a look at, or whether there's a topic that you hear brought up today that you'd like us to flesh out in more detail. So please feel free to use that, and we'll look to address as many of those questions as we can during the course of today's session. Um, so Nick, just picking up on, um, on the challenging point then that you brought up on there, what do you think are some of the yeah. biggest challenges around bridging today? Well, first of all, can I just say, is my screen frozen? No. <laughs> All right, that's positive. <laughs> that's uh, positive. Screen. So, uh, hey-ho. Um, so, um, challenges, um, there's, there's a few on the horizon. Um, I think uh, if looking at the, the, the big one is the, the, soft, the, the increase in cost of living. Uh, I think, you know, I think we've all sort of felt this, whether it be at the fuel pumps, the cost of utilities, um, you know, and obviously the interest rates as well, and they're set to sort of grow as well. So I think that there will be uh, a tightening of belts. Uh, and obviously that then impacts the housing market and, and, and everything that sort of knocks on from there. I think from, um, you know, look at property and property development, I think the, the, the two big areas, obviously the cost of uh, labor and the cost of materials for completing projects and doing projects as well is certainly one of the, the big areas and, and certainly some of the areas that we're seeing when we're talking to customers who are doing these types of projects and uh, they're currently live with us. The communication that we have with them, the, that, that increase can be quite significant in certain, certain scenarios as well. Um, the, the, the cost of a project and the cost of housing at the moment is really being squeezed at sort of both ends. You're paying sort of top end potentially for residential property. And then from a cost point of view of, of doing the project as well, both labor, not just the cost of the labor or the cost of materials, but it's actually making sure that they arrive on time so you can complete the project and exit as well. So everything is, 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 quite, uh, is quite challenging at the moment as well. And I think that as the residential market sort of starts to um, sort of, top out and for sort of price perspective there are other opportunities so if looking at the the cost of commercial premises or changing configurations of properties as well there may be some uh, bigger financial gains in those types of properties which was what we're seeing sort of the permitted development schemes and and the, and the certainly the support that the government have given on on things like that certainly making more opportunities but so certainly the cost of living uh, the cost of the cost of funds and the cost of interest going up as well. Obviously, the, the the bank base rate going out to sort of stabilize inflation as well. All of these things are putting certain pressures on um, on the the sort of property market. Um, and let alone that, we've still got to we're still yet to really feel the impact of the cost of what the pandemic has been, and certainly the financial stimulus package that the government have given out, which 
I think tops around about 180 billion pounds. That's got to be paid back and that's got to come from somewhere. I certainly know uh, payday today, the national insurance has gone up as well. So, you know, it's starting to hit people in the pocket all the time as well. So I think from my perspective, that's my biggest sort of concern, the increasing costs uh, of, of, of everything. And it's not just in the property market, it's, it's right across the country. Um, so there's, there's, these are two of the biggest challenges that we're, that we're sort of seeing at the moment. There is certainly surplus money out there and there's certainly a lot of funding availability. Um, but as that cost continues to creep up and with downward pressure in a competitive market, is that a, that, that sort of longevity of, of business model? We'll have to see how that sort of plays out. Interesting. Thank you. Gareth? Yeah, I think um, Nick's covered it off quite nicely there. I think the, the reality is that you know, there's a huge amount of pressure, whether it be, um, uh, you know, cost of living, whether it be the, the, the value of property is still going upward um, on, on that spiral, because obviously the lack of supply is there to fuel um, the, the, the want and desire of people to purchase property at a, at a good figure. Um, the reality is, you know, as soon as a decent house comes on the market in a decent location, it's snapped up within sort of 48 hours, which then has a, an over increase in the value um, add that you see on properties, which obviously then is causing quite a lot of the, the lower end, you know, first time buyers uh, continuing to see that angst, um, which is having an issue then on, on the property chains. Um, so you've got that overinflated price still coming through and that doesn't ever seem to be settling down. So as Nick quite rightly said, you then you couple that with the cost of living continually going up um, at this moment in time, you know, that inflationary pressure um, is quite firmly sitting at the door of the consumer. Um, so it's hard to see how that eases um, significantly enough um, over the coming months. So there's going to be a huge amount of pressure from that side of things. You know, as, as Nick quite rightly said as well, cost of um, actually transacting in property in terms of doing refurbs, renovations, uh, builds, you know, that's escalating. Um, you know, I was talking to somebody early this morning about the fact that they're coming back for a little bit more money on a deal because their cost of um, development, their cost of uh, works spiraled by 100% um, because obviously it's not just the case of the cost of the materials, but it's also, uh, you know, the, the builders or, or the handymen or whatever it is are, are inundated with work. So they're quite easily having to inflate their costs and, and turn work away. So not only are you having to pay the increase in materials, you're having to pay the increase in labour costs as well when it comes to that side of things. So, you know, there's a huge amount of pressure on, on the customer um, at this moment in time, which then, you know, uh, works into their favour in some instances and, and works to the detriment in the other um, from that side of things. And I think, you know, lenders as a whole, uh, Nick was quite right, there's a, a lot of liquidity in the marketplace. Um, so there's a lot of opportunity for lenders to, to lend money um, because there's a lot of money uh, backing them up. But I, I think the reality is there is pressure to that point as well, because obviously there's a desire to get that cash out into the marketplace. Um, so you'll find some push um, certainly you see that in the bridging industry a lot, you know, where people are uh, sort of pushing their products um, uh, and looking at some way to incentivize somebody to come and utilize them uh, for a short period of time. It's, it, I guess you run the risk with, in that side of things as, you know, how stable is that funding? Um, how long is that product set in terms of pricing points or, or incentive going to be there for? Um, so you, I think that's a, a, an area to be mindful of as a, as a broker and as a consumer as well. Excellent points. Thank you. Simon, anything to add to that? No, I don't, I don't think there is anything to add. I think the boys have absolutely knocked it on the head. I think I, I, I'll, I'll approach this from a, from a different different angle. But for me, the bridging market is actually full of water solutions. I think lots of lenders doing a variety of different things with some fantastic outcomes for brokers. More importantly, the clients. I think the guys are quite rightly, you know, the, the, the cost spiraling, you know, spiraling up. It's, uh, you know, we, we, we're all getting the pinch, the guys. I'm not going to talk more about that. I could, but I won't. There's no point because uh, the guys have absolutely smashed it out of the park with their answers. I think for me, um, if there was something that I wanted in the bridging market, it'd probably be just a bit, a bit more knowledge um, around the mortgage sector. I think for me, the likes of these webinars are really important. It gives brokers the ability to talk, you know, to, to go through the talk to the likes of Crystal, go through complex cases and bridging finance, um, which they deal with every day. You know, working together with lenders um, that are on the panel today and many more, Crystal offers solutions to brokers that, that, that maybe they won't have the access to and have that knowledge there. So for me, I think the biggest challenge point personally is actually heightening the knowledge of, of, of what bridging is and the solutions that basically it offers. 
Yeah, I think that knowledge is a is a really useful point because there is it's been mentioned already. There are so many bridging lenders in the market, and you know, as Gareth mm. mentioned, there's a lot of them that are putting incentives in place and almost chasing that small part of business that's available now. And that might not necessarily be the right outcome for the client because there's a, a longer piece of work there. There's always an exit in place. There's always a plan that the client's looking to achieve. And the good brokers are the ones that work with the clients both to see that initial deal done, but also then to see that through the life of the project and make sure that they can actually get out of the, at the end of that bridge. Hmm. Excellent. Um, so moving on to the, uh, the the big topic then. So COVID. Um, Nick, I'll start with, uh, with you with this one. Um, so what impact did COVID, and I suppose more importantly, the outrun of the COVID pandemic have on you as a lender? And what lessons do you think were learned from it? Yeah, I, I, I think the first lesson that was learned during COVID was that no one ever foresaw anything like that. You can do a lot of disaster recovery, a lot of planning, and you can think about the unthinkable. Um, but ultimately, I think that um, that no one expected this. And I think that those businesses that came through it and there were some tremendous businesses that were that that really adapted quickly um you've got to control the controllable and then you adapt to everything outside influences i think the embracing of technology right across financial services particularly during that first pandemic when um you know it was a case of nobody could go out no valuers could go out no solicitors could go out there was a there was almost a a grinding halt but actually technology played a huge part of it as well and i think that the development of technology uh, in the future is certainly paramount to 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 any business's you know f- uh, you know security in the future as well. I think keeping a focus on customer service side was 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 everything. I think I think people um, both with intermediate you know with our intermediaries and also with existing customers, the power of relationships really shone during these times as well. And I think that understanding. The transaction from the start and keeping in touch with the customers and actually trying to work with them during such a difficult time has certainly had a different view on how you maybe work with customers in the future as well um and i think you know if you do a a good job underwriting and understanding the transaction mitigating the risk day one then the the, the back end conversations certainly become a lot easier um if you're open to working with the customers maybe differently that you did in the past as well. And that certainly during the pandemic paid dividends uh, in the way that we approach both day one underwriting, but also uh, sort of back end customer service side and, and client servicing as well. You know, it's about positive customer outcomes on on projects. If you can get them to where they need to be, things may trickle over time, um, you know, the with, you know, the, 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 the shortage of materials, et cetera, as well. And I think working with the customers, working with the intermediaries, and being open with communication is 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 absolutely paramount, uh, and you see that now, um, you know, right across, um, even in in everyday living now, you, you know, customer service um, still doesn't feel back to where it was pre-pandemic, and whether that's shortage of employees or shortage of um, of or an increase in, in in issues as well, but customer service is the thing that really puts your brand ahead. Um, when you're looking to kick back in and, and grow the business from there as well. Yeah, thank you. Some good points in there. And are you seeing many clients that have been financially impacted by COVID? Um, yeah, um, you know, they're, 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 you know, you, you're getting projects coming through now, um, not from our existing lending, but actually newer applications coming through that, you know, over the last 18 months have, you know, either run out of funds or run out of time. Um, and those are the types of applications you've really got to understand because, you know, some of them are genuinely, you know, there's, you know, um, you know, we don't need to talk about the, the military issue that we've got uh, that's going on as well. But, you know, I didn't realize that wood chip, a lot of wood chip is made in um, um, is made in the Ukraine. So there are genuine, un, you know, things that have tripped over time and cost as well and the cost going up and, and time taking longer as well. Maybe not financially impacted, but certainly um, projects have overran and costs have gone up um, and we're getting, you know, sort of instead of what would have been in 12 months, a bit of a, uh, a, a development exit, it's more of a finishing exit. Um, so 
um, where they may have run out of uh, funds on a particular project, but they're still looking to raise a few pounds against it to then exit as opposed to just doing a straight development exit as well. So we are still seeing a lot of these types of applications as well, particularly where you've got customers who may not be as experienced in the, the refurbishment works that they're doing or the development that they're sort of doing as well. And that's that that's key as well, particularly in a, in a tough time is, is experience on these types of projects. You're always going to come up against bumps in the road uh, and uh, and problems with property. And it's actually how the, the customer has the ability to adapt his uh, way of working on that particular project as well. So, you know, it's um, the, there's certainly lots of applications out there and hopefully we'll, you know, we'll come out, the you know, sort of um, we'll come further in the future and things you know the the cost will sort of ease a little bit and the availability of materials uh, and labor will become a little bit easier as well so but right now yeah there's there's certainly applications that we're seeing that were done 12 months ago that haven't been finished yet and uh, it's it's you know really understanding the the sort of the the sort of transaction and the, and the ability to finish that project thank you um, and that comes back to the, the choice of lender as well at the start. When you're looking at placing a case with a particular lender, what are the overall mm -hmm. costs? What happens if that doesn't go to plan? How proactive will that lender be when working with a client? Which are all things that, that brokers need to be thinking about and taking on board. Yeah, sure. You know, having a look at contingency is, 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 a, is a big one. You know, over the last sort of, you know, particularly if you're buying, you know, things like steel and, and some of the really, you know, plasterboard, et cetera, you know, you can, you can, set on a price in in march and by the time it turns up in in may june it will have gone up in cost and you know that sort of contingency planning as well is 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 absolutely paramount as well things aren't always going to go to the same price from start to finish as well so having that uh, in the mind certainly is uh, is a big one thank you simon yeah i mean, I mean covid in itself i don't think has been an easy ride for any lender and unfortunately, I know we've seen some lenders come away from the market altogether, which is which is such a shame. But there are also we've seen lenders thrive uh, in the market during COVID and, and, and since COVID. At OSB, for those who don't know, um, we have such brands as Precise Mortgages, so it's Mortgages Bridge in Seconds. We have Kent, which is or Kent Reliance, which is Mortgages Interbay, which is commercial, semi-commercial, buy to let, bridge and holiday lets. And into about asset, into about asset finance and, and to be honest i think it's safe to say we took probably a more cautious approach than a lot of lenders to covid we, we pulled back on a lot of our lending channels observed the market and then re-entered the market when we felt the time was right um when we took a step back away from from the market um we, we really turned our, our focus of attention to the existing customers that we had that were affected by covid and how we, how we could help whether that was the payment holidays things like that looking at their individual circumstances when we've entered back into the different markets uh that we that we, that we operate in we've tried to do this correctly with the right products the right processes and procedures uh, we're also keeping focus on delivering for the brokers and, and, and customers, a very important piece that, that, that Nick exactly said, so just echo, echoing that. Um, this is still happening with us. Uh, criteria is changing regularly across all of the brands and we'll continue to monitor the markets and add criteria when we feel it, it, it's necessary. As for people that have been affected by, by financially by COVID, I'd love to say no, but I'd be fibbing. Um, so... I'm, I'm, I'm going to say, we've, you know, certain sectors have been really affected by COVID. And it's been a difficult time for a lot of people, which, which again, is such a shame. Um, we as a nation have been pretty resilient. I'm, I'm, I'm proud to say that I'm British and making the most of what we have and supporting those less fortunate. And I promise I'm not going to go into politics or get onto my soapbox. I, I, I promise. OK, <laughs> at OSP, we, we've taken the approach where... We, we, we hopefully give our underwriters the ability to properly underwrite a case, understanding the applicant's position, uh, while ensuring not putting anybody into additional financial difficulties who maybe can't afford it. So we will consider people who have taken a business balance back loan or C-bills loan to sort of to, 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 to manage their business through COVID. And I'm, I'm happy to consider, you know, across all our product lines, uh, we'll, we'll underwrite properly. I'd be, I'd be positive to sit here and say that 99% of all cases that, I, that, that you'll come across on product lines will get the correct decision for those COVID affected customers. We've put that much, we put that much focus on it. Okay. Thank you. Hmm. Gareth? Yeah, look, uh, again, echoing what the gents have already said, um, I think everybody has felt some of the pressure that's come through 
uh, during the pandemic. Um, you know, it wasn't easy at all. Um, you can see why decisions had to be made within businesses, um, whether they be from you know, pulling away from the marketplace for a, a period of time or or looking at how they mitigate their risk. You know, one of the things we quite rightly did in the first instance was evaluate um, how we can continue to support the broker market, which we did throughout um, the pandemic, um, how we mitigated our risk to, to continue to absorb that, how we then jumped in and tried to help where where others were being um, having to pull away or, or, or sort of things changing at the 11th hour. Um, and I think we did that incredibly well. Um, and it just showed the fluidity of our business and our ability to adapt and change on a regular basis. You know, we, we were making, having conversations every single day at the beginning of the day and the end of the day to see how things were, were moving and how things were changing. Um, I think one of the things we've, we've learned um, and, and one of the things I've certainly learned, um, the value of those little conversations you have, you know, the 30 seconds here, the minute there, the two minutes there within different facets of the business where um, you bounce things off people. Um, you know, you talk about relationships within the bridging space, the relationship within you and your introduction sources or your third parties that provide you with support. Um, it's phenomenal. But I think actually also the, the relationships you have as a business internally um, and the value that that adds. I think in the, the first few weeks, you know, there were, I was having somewhere in the region of, of 200 phone calls a day, which was just the people who work within the business, just to bounce, uh, you know, points off them, you know, help support them, try and get through a case, try and get through some of the little bits where you're mitigating some of the risk or whatever it might be. You know, and, the, and they're in the invaluable conversations you have now when you're sitting in the office and somebody comes over to you and says, right, can I just bounce this off you? Can I just have that uh, kind of support? Can I, you know, that sense of, of um, knowing that they're, what they're trying to do is the right thing to do. Um, and the value of that was huge. Um, and I just think that that's something that I think businesses will probably take a little bit for granted. Um, and I think what you're seeing in the in the wider marketplace now, whilst you still have some entities that are are still working from home or in a hybrid situation, you know, they're they're probably still feeling that pinch of those uh, that lack of those conversations and 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 the, the value that they really truly truly add to uh, to a business. I think um, in terms of uh, clients, yeah, I think certainly there's there's a lot of hurt that's been had, um, whether that be um, from a a transactional flow that's been elongated because you haven't been able to get the a project completed. Um, your profits have dwindled because of the cost of, of acquisition or the cost of um, uh, the, the materials and then the cost of works has, has spiraled up. You know, there are probably people out there that are making a, a loss or just washing their face in some of these projects because of the, the changes that have happened during that period of, of conversion or refurb. Um, I think you're certainly seeing smaller, you know, the SME business side of things. They've certainly felt the pinch. Um, if you look at the hospitality world and, and the, the areas off the back of that that have been really hamstrung, um, I think we've seen certainly a lot more people coming to us for support from a business funding point of view, looking at their assets uh, to strip equity out of, to try and keep and prop up their businesses to, to stave off the, the issue that, that COVID surrounded them with um, and, and the lack of liquidity coming into their businesses from being able to trade and, and transact. Um, and I think you'll still continue to see a little bit of that coming out. But also the big thing, is, as Nick um, alluded to there, you've got a huge amount of debt that's been taken uh, in Sybil's loans, um, which has got to find a way out um, and got to be repaid. You know, the government aren't going to sit there and um, not want to have some of their money back um, uh, over the, the, the coming months and years. Um, so there's going to be a real push to see some of that come back into the government. Um, and there's going to be a push on people to repay that debt. Um, so that's an interesting area that we we really haven't truly seen the hurt off the back of that as yet. I don't feel. No, good point. I think when we're talking about the kind of the runoff of the, the pandemic, we're all talking about getting back to work and things getting back to normal. But um, I think as you've all said, we're not quite back to normal yet. There's a lot of hybrid environments. There's artificial um, funding lines in the marketplace that are kind of keeping businesses afloat that might not have been previously. So I think we've got quite a long way to go before we we get to the bottom of, of what impact it actually did have on industry. 
And I think, uh, sorry to jump in, Chris, I think yeah. there's a big thing that the bridging industry does as a, phenomenally well is um, it's that customer centric journey um, proposition. You know, it's very much common sense based approach. It is a, a route of trying to find the best way to support a transaction um, in the most efficient um, way as well. And I think, you know, what we're seeing is where the bigger industries, uh, bigger institutions in terms of the mainstream mortgage world are sitting there on those hybrid uh, situations from a working perspective, best one in the world, they're always going to be impacted from a service delivery and turning cases around and transactions around within a sensible amount of time. I mean, that's something for a broker to be hugely aware of because there are going to be um, tight timescales where they're going to need to have resources that's coming to them and liquidity or, or transaction that's coming to them at a quicker period of time than, than a mainstream mortgage is going to be able to support them with. Well, that's a good point. Um, so picking up on that then, bridging is regularly discussed in terms of speed. Um, we touched earlier on the on the um, the pressures on the housing market and how properties are going on the market and offers are going in quickly we've got one of the lads here went to see a house on um friday uh, so he inquired about a house on friday that had just gone on the market saturday morning the vendors had refused to take any more bookings because they were inundated and no more viewings could take place on the property and it had been on the market you know, like three or four working hours so there is that mm -hmm. demand that people want to jump quickly and vendors want to move quickly um what tips can we give to the brokers on, on how to speed up their bridging applications um simon can we start with you on that one yeah, I mean, uh, currently our turnaround for AIPs uh, in precise and intubated are around four to five working hours. So we are, we are, we are pretty quick, most, mostly same day stuff. Um, our underwriters own a case from start to finish. Um, obviously, unless they're on holiday, but we have a buddy system with that. Um, it allows a better, better level of control, control on the urgency of cases. I think the key thing is know your case, know your case inside out, know the information about it so, so that if an underwriter makes a call or gives it, it's there, it's there, it's in front of them, you can give them the information. But know what needs to be achieved. So if you've got an auction purchase, let the lender know up front what that it's an auction purchase. If you've got dates that need to be achieved, let them know the dates. And all the underwriters ask, ask for information, they know exactly what they want. No more, no less. You know, if we if we bombard them with bombard them with with documents, they, they can often trigger um, more questions. It's about giving them exactly what they're asking for. Speak for you, with your BDM if you're unsure. Speak with Crystal. If you're not sure or confident on bridging. Um, don't leave it on your on your desk until it becomes urgent. It's probably the big one. If you can't do it, can Crystal do it? Most likely answer is yes. They have access to multiple different lenders. Even sitting on the panel here today, you've got three lenders that probably are in the similar spaces, but will still do things very differently. So it's just about it's about fronting up, know your case inside out, give the lender exactly what they want, but but also tell them what you're looking to achieve from it. What are the end dates? What are the goals? What are we looking to achieve when we get off the back of it? And I think that's that for me is 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 what speed's all about it's about the the, the actual working between the broker the packager and, and the uh, and the lender brilliant thank you gareth yeah i think um you know the knowledge is is a is a good tool um and seeking out first class knowledge like yourselves is is a really good help with any transactional flow i think um to my mind, you still run the risk within this space that sometimes a, a broker or a client thinks that a lender only wants to hear a certain amount of information. Um, you know, they don't need to know that other point. They don't need to have that other bit of information, um, which then invariably comes out in the woodwork and then uh, creates its own challenges because as, as you would expect, you know, further questioning comes out the back of that. Um, because actually you have to understand the, the whole kit and caboodle. Reality is, although bridging is um, you know, a fast and, and efficient way to, to lend money and, and complete a transaction, it's still lending money. There's a risk involved. So every lender will always want to mitigate their risks and underwrite the risk um, through providing um, and looking at documentation that supports a transaction. Um, you know, it's not done on the back of a fag packet, which sometimes could be the, the missed it's no more in the industry, you know, it is done by uh, old fashioned common sense based approach to underwriting and lending money. So the more information that you are provided, the better informed that lender is, uh, the easier it is to make a lending decision um, and the easier it is to overcome any stumbling blocks within that transaction. Um, you know, that can be overcome. Um, you know, it is a it is a space of 
I have a transaction. I understand why they want to do it. I understand what you're being provided as security and I understand how my loan is going to be repaid. And as long as you can cover off those points and suitably cover up those points from a risk perspective, then you can do a transaction. Um, so, yeah, I think, you know, provide the, the most accurate and detailed information as possible um, and allow the underwriters and the lender to make their decision off the back of that. I'd say it's very, very important. Perfect. Thank you. Nick? Uh, yeah, I mean, not much to add. I mean, there's a, the, the, the speed comes down to uh, a, a few elements, really. But uh, I think the number one intermediary is placing the right clients and projects with the right lender. Price isn't always everything. You know, different lenders have different appetites on different types of property, different types of projects as well. So making sure that you pick the right lender um, for the right project. What you don't want to do is go down a route because it's a, a rate, you know, price that you're sort of chasing where the lender isn't going to be comfortable with it. And ultimately it stops in that avenue and then you have to back up and go down a different avenue. But obviously that eats into time and obviously costs as well. So certainly picking the right lender for the right project for the right client, understanding the transaction from start to finish, make sure that the relevant paperwork is, is, is absolutely key as well. If the lender's asking for it, provide it. Um, and I suppose the final point, which, um, you know, it wouldn't be bridging without being brought up is getting the right property lawyer, um, you know, for the right project, um, making sure that, you know, that the, 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 the client, the, the lender, the intermediary want to work at a certain pace, but unless we've got the right lawyers in experience in these types of transactions, whether it be bridging or whether it be try refurbishment or development, whatever it is, it, it, having experience in that is, will, will certainly um speed up the process or or not having it will certainly considerably slow down the process brilliant thank you um, we've had a question come in from sarah around um experience and and how can we help people to understand especially if they're new to the sector what kind of information to provide i think what i'd add to that is is kind of taking a bit out of all of the answers that we've just had through um it's, it's that conversation you know the key thing is to, to talk through the deal to understand what it is the client's looking to do and to provide the information for a for someone like us at Crystal, that we can help you place that with the right lender. We've launched a mortgage desk for exactly that reason. You can pick the phone up at any time, speak to one of the guys there and just talk through what the client's looking to achieve. You know, we don't expect you to know lenders or rates or anything like that at that point, but that conversation, <laughs> we can give you the right information, we can then arm you with the tools to go away and have that further conversation. It's something that, mm. that Gareth mentioned there. It's, it's a really simple um, project really, isn't it? Who's the borrower? What are they looking to do? Um, what's the deal? What are we looking at? Lenders are, are confident enough, they know the criteria well enough to see whether that fits with them or not, but we need to arm them with the right information. And at the end of the day, it's a mortgage. So we're working with a borrower, we're working with a property. We just need to get transparency around that. So certainly pick up the phone, speak to a specialist, um, tune into to webinars like this where we can give more information out and try and educate people on what that market looks like. It's no doubt the, the industry is, is constantly improving. Um, it's a really fast paced industry, it moves very quickly. Um, it adapts very quickly to the market pressures and what's taking place in there as well. So it's um, kind of a shining light in the in the specialist finance world when some of the more institutionalised lenders um, are kind of setting their ways a bit more and stuck on processes. I used to work for a, a lender where we got I think we got four different systems because of the acquisition journey that they've been on. Certainly, bridging isn't anything like that. It's a conversation. It's talking through with an underwriter and and let's find an outcome for the client. Hmm. Chris, I'd, I'd add to that as well and say that you know they're. It, it, it is a specialist market for a reason. It's certainly one of those areas that you shouldn't run before you can walk. I think learning, because bridging can be so um, so wide in its, its requirements, you know, what you can use it for, when you can use it, why to use it. I think really understanding the different nuances with each product, um, but also all the different lenders as well. It is a very, very competitive wide marketplace out there with, with lots of um, hooks of people trying to get you know, business in as well as well. I think that until you really truly understand the market, particularly, you know, short term um, bridging finance, going through experts that can talk you through and walk you through that journey as well um, and help support you of your understanding and training as well. So it's certainly one of those that that looks well, it's quite straightforward. It's, you know, it's this LTV or it's, it's this project. But actually, there are lots of um, lots of trip ups along the way that with the right lender, being placed by with 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 the right expert but broke it they make it look easy when actually it's not always as easy as it it, it may be yeah that's a very good point um so a hot topic in the industry at the moment then is is green mortgages um a lot of the buy-to-let lenders are moving into this space um 
from 2025, there's a new proposal to raise the EPC standard even more. Are you seeing any changes in the bridging market or any demand for this type of finance at the moment? Um, Nick, do you want to start us off with that one? Um, yeah, certainly. I think, you know, that um, that EPC uh, and the changes and the proposals, et cetera, is certainly something that we're starting to see more of. There's more awareness of it. But I still think there's more that can be done. I think there's certainly a lot of uh, investors out there that may not be doing this full time professionally um, and are maybe not aware of all these changes that are, are actually required as well. You know, and certainly the costs involved in changing from what's currently an E to what needs to be a C by 2025, and then obviously onwards from there as well. There is significant costs that can be that can be uh, required to do the properties up as well. Um, we're certainly seeing more clients looking to change property configuration. So, you know, trying to maximize the income coming from their portfolio on residential, turning to HMOs or turning to holiday lets with, you know, staycations being still a, a you know, a, a big thing in the UK as well. And actually through these sort of conversions, they are looking to use newer methods of construction as well. Um, but as the as the development of of these types of new you know methods of construction, whether it be uh, you know um, you know sort of block properties built abroad and brought over, etc., as well, it's more of the exit of the bridges through conventional lending, which will make these types of projects a little bit more attractive as well. Um, but yeah, I mean, ultimately, there's going to be a, a big push towards carbon zero. Twenty thirty is is seven years ago, and you know, I remember when I was, you know, seven years ago, it, it it always felt like an eternity, but it will be, it'll, it'll creep up. And I think that there's, there's more that can be done on the education and awareness of what things have got to happen and, and when as well. Um, but I still think as, as properties are being developed um, and certainly refurbishments, and, and there's certainly more and more refurbishments happening to, to maximize the revenue, there's, 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 there's certainly a, um, a focus on this EPC. Thank you. Gareth? Yeah, I think, um, look, by the nature of the beast, bridging has always been utilised as a tool to do light refurbs, uh, renovations, that kind of stuff. So you're always going to be uh, open to uh, property investors being mindful of, of the changes that are coming. I think if they're already transacting in a refurb or renovation or a purchase of a dilapidated property, then their mind is already set on trying to achieve that minimum standard that's going to be a requirement, um, you know, come come 2025. I think the reality is that um, with those that are sitting on existing portfolios, so property investors that are sitting on existing portfolios, I think they haven't yet come to... Uh, the fall with this thought process because the reality is we live in a world where you know time does slip away from us and, and unless it's there in your forefront or you have to have something done um, that's being pushed um, in front of you at that moment in time you're not just going to jump on it because it's going to cost you money um, so I think we were yet to see the real implications of this coming through. And I actually think there's possibly going to be an element of hurt that's going to come out of this as well, because at the point where somebody does have a portfolio that might need to be um, refinanced and they're going to have maybe lower valued properties where the cost implications of getting it from an E to a C um, might not really wash its face. Um, you know, there's going to be an interesting um, position we're going to find ourselves in as we get closer to 2025 where actually does it make financial sense to a property investor to actually spend the money to pull it up to a to a um a, an appropriate rating um you know because it's you know if you've got a 50 to 100,000 pound property and you've got to spend 10,000 pounds to put everything in it does it make sense um so i think we're going to find ourselves in an interesting position the closer we get to, to 2025 um, and maybe we'll start to see people looking to dispose of assets um, within their portfolio um, because they just can't accommodate the cost. It's an interesting That's a really good point. Really good point, Gareth. Yeah, there's nothing for me to add there, Chris, at all. You're, you're on mute as well, mate. So no. <laughs> nothing for Always me to add there at all to that. But um, what I'd say is what a great excuse for a broker to pick up with their landlord clients and pick up early with them you know the, the, the guys that they've got on their on their books that, that, that have portfolios and giving them that 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 information the relevant information that 
you know, by 2025, we've got to get, raise the properties on new rented properties up to a C. And by 2028, you know, we all need to comply with the existing ones that are there in portfolios. It gives the ability to, 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 talk, to talk to their customers, pass on that knowledge, but also the ability then to sort of put plans in place with their clients to actually look like what is the you know if surely we do in it we need a review meeting let's sit down what's the plan you know let's look at the costings let's see where your properties are um you know great excuse to talk to customers and, 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 and their landlord their landlord clients specifically to actually drum up and and and, and help them you know come out of this and what the plans are perfect thank you um i've had a couple of questions coming live that we can um that we can jump on to um, is there a clear, agreed, industry-wide definition of differences between what would count as light refurb, heavy refurb, and development, or what sort of activities would fall into each category? I think each lender's got a different view on the, the actual definition of what is light refurb, heavy, and, and development. Mm. Um, Simon, do you want to pick that one up first? How would you classify the three? Yeah, so, so with us, uh, our, our, our light refurb is no changes to the to the skeleton of the property outside of the property, the property footprint. So no extensions, uh, no structural work. That, that That is basically where you're going up to sort of, uh, and, and, and no, no, no planning permission needed. That is your light refurb. Then your heavy. Um, we're, we're going into uh, we're going into the where you'll where you'll do extensions where you need where you need planning permissions and things like that. And actually, at the moment, we actually don't do development finance in the, in the, in the OSB group. So, in, in, in the, I'll, I'll allow the guys. Well, obviously, get the guys to cover cover that. Thank you, Nick. Where would you sit on yeah, the like, like you say, there is no um, industry standard. Every lender looks at it slightly different based off their risks, based off their appetite for those types of applications. At West One, typically light refurb uh, doesn't require any planning permission or sort of approvals uh, as such. Uh, medium would be classed as, um, so just, just on that, so there'd be uh, no sort of extensions, no sort of planning required. Medium is typically sort of no monitoring surveyors, but inspections. Uh, during the process as well for further drawdowns, uh, you 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 can look at the um, the planning requirements on that as well. So we would require if there is extensions or if there is a, a larger footprint going on, we'd require proof of that. And then you've got the the sort of the the, the heavy developments, which is you know where monitoring surveyors are being used, planning permissions required, full structural works, things like that as well, or or or, or conversions. Um, they're typically the types of things that are required in heavy as well. Thank you. So it's, it is all different. Yeah, thank you. Gareth? Yeah, look, echo the same. The reality is for a heavy refurb uh, position, we'd be looking at structural and plan permission orientated works. Um, and then obviously a light is the, that that you'd see as a tartan turn. So new kitchen, new bathroom, modernization throughout. I think the reality is as a lender, we look at um, risk involved because uh, you could have some transactions which would be planning permission um, and structurally orientated work where there's less risk involved in it. Um, so you would, uh, again, accommodate um, maybe a greater rental value or a cheaper pricing point on that because the risk um, uh, has been mitigated by the, the, the type of works that are there. Um, so we always take a, and try to take an objective view on the, each transaction as a whole. Um, you know, we'll we'll complete um, self builds, we'll we'll complete conversions of, of, of properties um, from a bigger perspective. And you know, if it is just internal fixtures and fittings, and there's building rig sign off all the way through the transaction, again, you could look at that from a from a lighter refurb point of view rather mm -hmm. than a um, a, a development or or heavy refurb side of things. I think if, one of the key points I would always look at is when a broker's looking at a transaction like this, what a lender looks at is ultimately how is the value of my security going to be impacted? Um, you know, a light refurb is generally only ever going to be an add value transaction. So you're only ever going to see an increase in value through the life of the cycle of the works. I think when you're going into the heavier refurb side, um, generally you're going to see potentially a detrimental impact on the valuation in those first stages of, of, of what's going to happen to the property because it's going to be stripped back to brickwork or there's going to be a whacking great hole put on the back where they're going to put an extension on it. So there's going to be an adverse impact on, on the value of an asset. Um, so I think that's something to bear in mind when you're when you're looking at these transactions as well. Perfect. Thank you. Ilham, he's followed that up with um, a pre-registered question, I suppose, with um, would bridging allow a client to remortgage an owner-occupied house 
in order to build a new property on the plot next door on a large corner plot with full planning already granted is that something you consider gareth yeah yeah we definitely would um the reality is there's got to be enough value within the existing property um the one thing you have to bear in mind on on this scenario is obviously the regulator uh, dictates to a regulated lender that you can only do a maximum of 12 months um, on a regulated loan so you have to look at your exit surrounding this transaction in, in a lot greater detail i would suggest that if you are looking at a transactional scenario where somebody's looking to build uh, a new property within the, the footprint of the existing land um, and are looking to sell that property as the exit for the loan, so the repayment strategy for the loan, I think that causes you more angst because the reality is you have to be able to predetermine at the outset of the loan that your loan can be repaid within 12 months. Well, if it's a nine month build, the best one in the world is you're probably not going to get that transaction through and sold within that next three months window, especially if you put in, um, you know, your areas of where uh, the, you know, there may be an overrun in, in the timings for that side of things. But what we quite often see is people are looking to um, build a new home within their footprint of their garden uh, to move into and sell the existing um, and obviously the existing can be on the market well, well before the, um, the completion of that build. Um, so again, that's an easier transactional um, view that you can take on that because you can obviously see that that property can be pre-sold and ready to go um, as soon as they're ready to move into the, the, the new project or the completed development. But so it's an easier one to be mindful of. Yeah, interesting points. Thank you. Anything to add to that, anyone? Not really, no. I mean, particularly from a, a regulated point of view, it's down to the experience of the individual as well. I think, uh, I, I don't know if you like me, I uh, thoroughly enjoy a bit of grand designs, but most of them go over build and over time. Um, so it's how the clients, particularly in the current climate as well, um, have that experience to sort of um, work within that constraint of the 12 minute, uh, the 12 month, not 12 minute, that would be really constrained, <laughs> the 12 month um, sort of time scale that you've got to repay uh, back in a regulated transaction, definitely. Perfect, thank you. Um, we're running short of time, but the two questions I just want to focus on um, just to finish up. Uh, one's come in from the, the, the attendees, uh, which ties into the crystal ball bit that we try and add to the end of this one. Um, so where does the panel see the next steps in the evolution for bridging? Um, it, whether it be around criteria or regulation. Um, and I suppose to add to that, what do you think, what do you predict will happen if you were looking into your crystal ball within the next 12 months in the bridging market? Simon, do you want to start us off? Oh, he went. Uh, so he didn't <laughs> like the question. He didn't want to answer that. <laughs> yeah, uh, Gareth? Look, I think um, the reality is if, if there's no crystal ball needed. I think, you know, there is going to be an element of pain, as we spoke about earlier, with regards to consumer, um, with that uh, increased um, uh, cost of life, as it were, that, that we're seeing currently. So I would suggest there's an element here that you're going to continue to see people uh, capital raising to put into businesses, capital raising to, to look at further investment, to, to improve their portfolios. Um, there may be a well see people looking to strip equity out on second charges. Um, to continue to do some of the, um, the, the refurbs and renovations and support their, their flow into more property transactions. Um, I think the, the interesting thing will be the pressure that's placed upon um, the refinance and remortgage world. Um, I think as, the, you know, as, as Nick said earlier about the base rate moving up, um, it mortgage interest rates are moving up, although they're, they're all over the shop at this moment in time. Um, the reality is they're, they're only going one way you've probably had a historically uh, low interest rate environment where people are sitting on maybe um, standard variable rates and have sat on standard variable rates or trackers for a long period of time that are gonna to start to see some hurt um, coming through from that side of things because their interest rates are gonna slowly but surely go up. So I think there's a, a great opportunity as, um, as Simon alluded to earlier to, for people to get in contact with their, their portfolio landlords who are sitting there um, on property that they haven't done anything with for a period of time. I think the, the more proactive you are in trying to source um, opportunity for your clients, whether that be through refinances or second charges or, or, or anything along those lines, is a good opportunity um, to, for you to try and prove yourself to be uh, more beneficial to them um, by, by placing them um, with a better lender or by stripping some equity out and, and utilising it as the cash is king tool um, that I think you know second charge bridging finance can be at times as well. Um, yeah, it's, a, it's an interesting one from that perspective, because I think, you know, 
this forecasting of the future is a very interesting topic over the last two years because you know we, we start to see the uh, see the wood of the trees and then suddenly um as as nick mentioned earlier there's something else going on in the world which um is changing the dynamics of, of life um you know uh, in U ukraine and, and i don't think anybody forecasted that we'd come out of a pandemic and start to see the holy grail of, of easing of restrictions to then moving to something else that's going to cause us a little, a little bit of uh, angst yeah, it's certainly been a challenging couple of years with things um surprising yes. things happening um, just um, to jump back on the previous question, so Pankaj has just got a follow up for you, Gareth, just regarding the building in the in the same plot. Yeah. Um, just to confirm how you tackle the mortgage on the current house. I think you, you mentioned it's all got to fit in with the LTV of the current yes. um, yeah. scenario there. So you did have to repay that or. Yeah, you, you could either take a second charge um, over that assets um, and, uh, and look at it from that perspective. I think one of the things you've got to be very mindful of within this transaction is ultimately, as you quite rightly say, it's got to fit within a, an appropriate loan to value um, whilst uh, the property is, is coming out of the ground from the new development side of things. We wouldn't necessarily attribute any value to that side because we wouldn't um, do ground up development on a, on a regulated basis, especially, but um, just within our product set. So we've got to look at what the value and, and the value of the assets as it stands, um, that's existing uh, property that's there on that side of things, and then tie all the loan to values in appropriately to that, that basis. Um, okay. So yeah, look, there's an opportunity to do a second, repay the existing. What you generally find though, is a lot of these people are, are more uh, on the realms of lowly geared or, or unencumbered. Um, they're looking at it as a retirement play. Perfect, thank you. I hope that covers your question there, Pankaj. Um, Nick, over to you with the uh, the view into your crystal ball. Crystal ball. Yeah, um, 12 months can be a, a very long time in lending. Um, it's still a, a you know an un uncertain future out there as well. You know, we mentioned around the, uh, the pandemic uh, financial package the government have put together, the increase in cost of living, constraints on time and construction. Um, you know, there's potential difficult times ahead. There's, there's, there's no doubt about that. But currently, as we see it, you know, the, the lending market is buoyant. There's surplus levels of, of money available and there's certainly more and more opportunities to lend. Um, so I think that uh, a lot of it depends on the, the housing market. You know, a lot of this, um, you know, particularly around the economy, which, you know, 2020, you know, took just shy of a 10 percent backward step and there's still you know a little space to sort of bounce back um 21 we saw a, a growth of three percent in the economy and projected between five and seven in 22 but we're still below um where we were pre-pandemic in, in the economy so there's there's certainly um opportunity out there um but as the you know the bank base rate starts to to increase and starts to um hit the the, the every person in the uh, in, in the pocket it's, it still will put pressure on the future. Um, although having said that, in, in most counter-cyclical environments, there's always opportunity for the right investors. You know, those who recognize the, the, the right opportunities, semi-commercial, commercial, mixed use, you know, the, there's a lot of opportunities within that, the change to permitted development rights. Um, these will make easier gains for people to, to, to convert property from commercial to residential. There's still uh, a lack of housing out there um, and you know we are a, a nation of homeowners so from that side of things there's 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 more opportunities as well it's just trying to diversify portfolios and and, and maximize the revenues for these types of projects and, and and it's particularly these types of projects that lend themselves very well to short-term finance you know and certainly large upside gains particularly as the the residential stocks is is um low and uh, and certainly to 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 buy into them, you're certainly paying higher than you probably would do as well. So I, I think that for the right opportunities uh, and the right types of investors, I think the bridging market will still continue to thrive. Um, whilst mainstream lending concentrates on its straightforward vanilla uh, mortgage buy to let world and um, anything around the sort of edges of this, where you're um, trying to change a property or create a, uh, a portfolio, I think there's certainly opportunity for short-term finance. Touching on the question around the evolution of short-term finance and bridging, what does that mean? I, 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 it's very difficult to sort of say, really, because you know the, 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 the product is very much around 
you know, arrangement fee, cost and exit. You know, there's not an awful lot that can sort of change within that. If you look across the market, you've got residential, you've got commercial, you've got auction finance, property finance, you know, the, the, the types of property, the areas that what you can lend, what you can use this product for is as, is as wide as it gets. Um, so I think that the next potential evolution for short term finance, and you're seeing this now, is that more of the, the lenders are going into a more of a longer term type product. So over the last sort of three to five years, the, the sort of bridging finance people have stepped into a five year product. Uh, and then a sort of seven year product. And there are some lenders, obviously, that do bridging uh, like ourselves and, 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 and a few others, obviously, Simon uh, and the team there that do the full 25. And I think that what the opportunity there, coming back to my customer service point, is that if you can get customers, uh, investors or developers that t- t- take short finance, short term finance out for development finance. And then from that point, you can then bridge the exit and then from that, turn them into a full term buy to let process. You've got the whole cradle to grave um type project finance within your business i think couple that with good customer service and, and and good intermediaries and working closely with everyone on communication that future is certainly there excellent thank you that was a bit long-winded i think i'm really sorry no no it's good it's all good um simon welcome back apologize for that it came off with a, an update and i pressed update now so it knocked me out so i apologize for that. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I think I think Nick's just absolutely nailed it on the head. The, 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 the bridge market there is ma- there is massive massive opportunity out there. It's just um, ensuring that that that, that, that the opportunities we, we we actually take advantage of them. I think lots of lenders out there doing lots of different things, although all in the same space. And I think that's really positive. You've got the three guys sitting here who will, will do different things in the same market. You've got the specialists out there who the likes of yourselves, uh, uh, Chris and your guys, who who know where things fit. There's there's opportunities out there. There's definitely. Um, we do a refurb to let type product where we, we, we will basically um, do a bridge and a term loan with so and a mortgage with precise all in all based on one on one valuation. I think there's lots lots of other opportunities out there. Nick mentioned the PDR changes. You've seen lots of those come in. So commercial into resi, those sorts of things. It, it, it's about not being scared of it. And, um, and if you can't do it yourself, it's about getting the right expert advice of people who can, whether that would be the lenders themselves or whether that can be crystal and park that there. It's about taking advantage of the opportunities that, 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 that come. Um, I think there's lots more to do in the market crystal ball about where it's going i'm exactly saying that it's difficult um because it will depend on you know the, the squeeze on individuals the money the opportunities is there going to be is there going to be um stock on the market that's that's a big thing at the moment where there's not much stock out there so um it's about just knowing the opportunities when they're there and knowing where to go with them and i think for me um i love being part of this market it's fast-paced it's um there's some real good. You, you, you'll notice with us, with us sitting here on the panel, you know, we, we, we all work with each other. We've all got our own sections. There's, there's enough business out there for all of us to make a really good living, and that includes all the brokers that are on the call today. It's just about having it, grabbing hold of it, and knowing where it goes. And, and, and Crystal, f- for you guys that aren't sure on bridging, is probably that first step. Get your things into Crystal, understand it, log into these types of webinars and things like that. And, um, and, and, and take advantage of the opportunities that, that arrive without a doubt. Brilliant. Chris, um, can I just say yeah. one thing? Sorry, apologies. I think one of the, we talk about evolution um, and one of the things we talk about there is obviously technology and, and the ease of use within the journey. Um, I think one of the things I've been mindful of from an evolutionary point of view within the bridging space is sometimes it can fall foul as new entrants come in or bigger entrants come into the marketplace that it forgets what bridging finance is all about. I think one of the things that, you know, people like yourselves um, truly do add that value to is is reminding the broker that it, it, although it is a short term mortgage, a bridging loan, you know, there are that it is that uh, tool that is very much common sense based approach to lending but not trying to um, forget the, where its roots are, which is that, that objective view to lending as well, finding a, finding a transaction in front of you, finding a way to be able to do it, uh, you know, find a way to make that transaction work by mitigating your risks in, in what way you need to, to be able to do that. 
Yeah, that's a very good point. And a lot of lenders have, have come in with, with the view that technology is the way forward and we can automate as much of the process as possible. But um, it's really important that people don't forget that a lot of bridging is done on a conversation. It's about understanding, getting to the bottom of what the journey is, what the story is, and then making that outcome work for the clients. That's something yep. that we've been working on our technology platforms for quite Definitely. a while. And it's all been built around using technology as an enabler rather than taking over from people doing their actual job. So um, having that conversation, as you say, is, is essential. Um, we've overrun on, on time, Gent. So thank you for, for all of your input today. Um, there's been some excellent topics that have been brought up, some really interesting points that have been raised there as well. Um, so a massive thank you, Gareth, Nick, Simon. Thank you for sharing your time and expertise with us this morning. I think no problem. For Thanks for having us, Chris. Really enjoyed it. Thank you, Gareth. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Take care. I think the key thing for the, the brokers that, are, that have tuned in here, if I was going to take one takeaway from this, it would be um, to pick up the phone, talk to your clients, talk to your buy to let investors, look for an opportunity to re engage with them, be that the EPC, be that uh, conversions, whatever it is they're trying to do, and look at building the opportunities from there. Pick up the phone, speak to our mortgage desk, and let's get some business mm -hmm. placed together. So, Hopefully you've all picked up something from that. So thank you for joining us today. And hopefully I'll see you again next time on the next Crystal webinar. Thank you.